re repeat the question? HTX. And what was the second, how do you spell the second one? HT Access, I believe, it depends. It's probably on an Apache web server. Um, let's look it up to see exactly what it does. I believe it's a, again, it's a configuration file. Um, original purpose was to allow per directory access. Okay. Uh, it also, you can also put information in there about redirecting um, from one page to another. Um, for example, one thing you notice that they do here at LC a lot um, is if there's a special program, like let's say there's career week was last week, they might make a simple URL like lc, lorraincc.edu slash career week. And that redirects to some actual URL, some longer URL. And that's controlled by the uh, uh, HT access. Um, it also MIME types, in other words, how the server should handle sp uh, specific file types, and so on. So probably in your case, web dev is probably a folder that you have. And, and probably uh, they're not uh, permitted access to it or whatever and, and needs to be changed. Yeah. All right. We were running through um, using CSS for layout. And I, I have to double check to see where we were at exactly with it because I don't remember off the top of my head. I know we were covering floats. Um, we're going to talk a bit more about that today and either today or when's the next time we meet? Thursday we will talk about uh, mobile development. Um, but let me download the example that we had last time and have a few general words about it. Oh, the Apple Watch? Oh, okay. I apparently did not upload the lecture from last time. Okay, here's where we uh, sort of our last version, and this was uh, again a fairly simplified, straightforward version. We could finish it off and, and add some things, but this was done with floating. All right, if we look at the CSS for this, um, we will see that in all cases we are floating to the left. And again, what that means is floating to the left means shove it to the left as far as you can, provided it fits. All right, so if there is a sufficient available space, it will slide it to the left alongside of the element to the left of it. If it doesn't fit, then it will um, drop it down below. And this creates what's sometimes called liquid layouts or fluid layouts in the sense that they sort of conform themselves to the, the size of the, the browser window. All right. Um, the other thing that we saw was clear both. And clear both allows us to um, sort of stop the floating. 
So in the case of the footer, we want the footer definitely to be below everything else. We don't want it ever to accidentally be on the same line. So we clear both and it'll, it'll uh, appear like that. Um, a, few, a few pieces of advice. First of all, don't try to micromanage the CSS. All right? Don't try to control every single aspect of the layout and where things land. All right? Remember that the browser also has a role to play here. The browser um, positions things, if you don't otherwise say, using sort of the flow. All right? So you don't have to worry about trying to micromanage and putting everything in a proper place. Let the browser do its thing in many cases. Second thing, second consideration is don't be concerned with what is called uh, a pixel perfect layout. A pixel perfect layout is, is sort of a carryover from the fact that many graphic designers in the past especially got their start doing like magazine layouts or advertising layouts or that sort of thing. And when you do that, you know, you don't worry about screen sizes and page sizes. If you're laying out a magazine cover, <laughs> well, I did look first to see what it was. <laughs> but when laying out that, you don't have to worry about, well, one person's going to get this magazine and it's going to be eight and a half by 11 and another person's going to get it and it's going to be three foot tall by two foot wide. All right. Uh, another person's going to get it and it's going to be uh, four inches uh, wide and six inches tall. Right. It's this big. And it doesn't matter what I do with this, everything stays in the same position. All right. <laughs> And originally, graphic designers sort of had that mindset for websites, too, that, gee, we better make it so it doesn't matter what we view it on, it looks identical. And um, what I'm saying is that, it, that that's not necessarily the goal, all right? Um, the goal is for it to be workable and to look good and be workable across different platforms. So if it looks different, that's fine, all right? Provided that it's workable and provided um, that, uh, you know, it looks good and is functional and all that across platforms. Another thing to keep in mind is that of all the things that we've talked about so far in the class, this is the one that is most prone to have browser compatibility issues. All right? And therefore, testing across browsers becomes, is becoming more and more critical. You know, when you look at the assignments that we did in week one and week two, well, you could hardly go wrong, all right? You, you, you could hardly make a, a page that looked differently um, across different browsers unless you were really trying hard to make mistakes, all right? Whereas with this, sometimes it doesn't work out exactly the way you want. You then have a decision to make. All right. The, the theoretical part of me says you can design a page so it will be good across platforms. The practical part of me says, however, that if you find that there's a bug in Netscape 2.0, maybe you don't really need to worry about it All right, because of the percentage of people. Especially you don't need to worry about it if it's at least workable in those environments. So if, if it's not optimized, if it doesn't look great, that's fine. Uh, but, again, so, you know, one of the considerations is, is the percentage of people that use a particular browser. Um, it's, it's difficult to get browser statistics. Uh, in addition, it's difficult because, how do I want to put this? Um, it's not necessarily going to be consistent across every website. For example, if you had a, uh, if you looked at the statistics of who is visiting some great graphics design site, probably people have the newest browsers, 64 inch monitors, you know, that sort of thing. Whereas if you visit uh, a site that is, 
say that the general public um, would equally access uh, across the board, it isn't really specialized to the field, then you're going to get a sort of different distribution. So again, know your audience. All right. Um, I, I don't know what it is about the way this room is designed, but I, I hear every single noise. Yeah, it's, it's like, it sounds like there's an, I don't know, an earthquake or, or, or something uh, going on out, out there. All right. Another thing is you can sort of mix and match things. That's sort of the thing that I'm going to do next is a little bit of a hybrid. And I'm going to cheat a little bit on this one. I'm going to cheat by, oh, yeah. I'm going to cheat by putting in what uh, is called a container div. All right. A container div is cheating because it's HTML that doesn't really add any content. It's just there so I can cheat and style it. All right? So, yeah, cheating in style, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go. I don't know who that is, but <laughs> but I did. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean he's an actor, but I couldn't tell you anything he's been in. Uh, um, now there is another actor that they just showed. Uh, they found a video of when he was dancing when he was 12 years old. I don't think that's him. It might be something Gosling. Ryan Gosling. Okay, that's it. The Ryan is what threw me. And like, he's like this little 12 year old man and he like has all the moves out there. It's crazy. You should, you should, you should look it up. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a container div. All right. And a container div is just something like this. Div, I'm going to give it an ID of container. And sometimes they will say wrapper too, because it sort of wraps everything up. All right? The reason I'm going to do this is then I can treat that as just one big block and do stuff with it. And then I can sort of do stuff inside of that block. So I'm going to go and I'll put my container div, and I'll put my ending container div here. And let me save it. And then I'm going to go do something like container with sixty percent min width five hundred pixels margin. Wow, we, we, are, we, uh, we have a fired up class today. You must be sensing spring break is around the corner. Oh, you, you, you had your nap and now you're, okay, all right. all right. So I went and I put a container div that goes around and then I set that big block as having a width of 60%, minimum width of 500 pixels, and for good measure, I'll put a border around it just so that we can see. Border, one pixel, black, solid. And then we can go and look at this. And... I save everything. Oh, pound sign container. <laughs> All right, there we go. Now we have that block, and as again, as we make it bigger or smaller, there's some flexibility to it. All right, uh, and then we can style inside that using the float. All right, uh, which I'll do in a minute here.
Now, one great thing that you can do with this, if you use this technique, and, and, you, and this is something that's pretty common, is you could put like a background image on the page. All right? And in that way, you sort of have like a frame that's an image, and then the main content area in the middle. Now, um, we could pick background images a couple different ways. We could pick just one giant image and have that the background. Or what we could do is we could pick a pattern. Just like, you know, if you have like tiles like for, for your floor or for like ceramic tiles on the wall, there'll be a, p pardon me? Candy canes. Candy canes. <laughs> okay. I, I'm not, I'm not familiar, it's been a while since I taught CISS 121, so I'm not familiar with that. But the, the idea is, is with these, they, they, they're like tiles in that they interlock when you have them. And we can go and we can do a search for background tiles. Yeah, back, we can do sequels or sequins or... Yeah. Oh my goodness. If this was Thursday, I'd just walk out now. That would be it. I I I, I do wish I actually had like a mic instead of this, because it's hard it's hard to do the mic drop with this, you know. Yeah, right, right. Uh, let's see. All right, let's pick this one. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to save it to my folder here, my fromage folder. All right, now you can give a background, and I'm going to put that background on the body, and I can say, whoops. URL, and then in parentheses, I can put the name of the file. And again, provided it's in the same folder, I just need to put the name of the file. I probably should display the extensions to make sure that I get the precise file name correct, including the extensions. So tile underscore 031.jpg. All right. And nothing. Did I save it? I don't think it matters. I had a space between URL and that. Okay, so there you see the problem with doing background images is that um, depending on how the text is, you can't see. All right. Now there'd be a couple ways that I could handle this. All right. What would be one way that I could handle this? Yeah, put a color on the wrapper, right. That would be sort of straightforward uh, way. And so what I could do is I could give a background color to the container. (laughs) 
So there we have that. All right. There's also things that you can do with the opacity of it, which I would encourage you to try so you can make it so that it sort of peeks through a little bit. All right. And uh, that can be done to, to good effect. Now, that is definitely one of those things that there is an issue with across browsers. But that, that's, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so at any rate, the idea here is this is a good way um, to make the page uh, a little more um, attractive. And um, there we go. Now what I can do is let's go sort of finish this guy up to make it, and, and let's do some different things here. All right. Uh, it looks clear to me that I need to add some padding, right, because uh, the, the, the headings and, and, and all that is flush right up against the border, and, and that's probably not good. So let me start by adding some padding to it. And what I can do is, That's sort of a shorthand, the asterisk, to say give everything a padding of that. All right. So I don't, I don't know if that's what I really want, but I wanted to show that. All right. I wanted to show that that I can at least do that. And actually, yeah, it doesn't look horrible. Let's, yeah, let's let's do some things with the nav though, to uh, to get that. Let's float the nav to the right. <laughs> you know, that is, that is such a cold song, if you listen to it. <laughs> it, is a, it is a great song, but yeah, that is such a cold song. All right. And there we have that. Um, yeah, and we can go, and what are some other things we probably want to do? We probably want to get rid of the bullet points on the nav. Nav UL. What's the attribute for this? List file type, thank you. All right. Um, One thing we could do, and this is, this is a neat trick, is what if we want to make the links sort of take some of these colors off? All right. How can I tell what color this is? Eyedropper. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Paint, open this guy up in Paint, and I hope Paint has this capability. And I click on the little eyedropper guy, and I could pick a color. So I'm going to click there. Yeah, there we go. Um, it gives us a color, but it gives it to us in decimal, not hex. All right. So we got to convert. All right. So. Let me write this down so I remember. This is, yeah, they do. And we'll look at that in a second here. But there's also an alternate way of specifying colors. And that is, I believe I can give RGB and give the numbers in decimal. All right, and there you notice, now they're that color. 
Probably also want to get rid of the underline text decoration. None. On the visited. Why not? Let's let's do that. Line through, Line through, not strike through. <laughs> Still not working. That's a text dash decoration. Good, good question. Text decoration. Line dash through. Let's do this. Repeat, please. No, say colon. Make the color black. Yeah, that worked. And go. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure why strike through isn't working. I guess we can potentially chalk that up to a browser compatibility issue or or something like that. So it's a good idea actually to do the to, to, to do that because that way we see uh, yeah that way yeah we, we see um, that would especially be good if you were for a certain kind of site, right? For a site that was like sort of a checklist. Like where you go one, two, boop, boop, you know, it would kind of show you that you made it that far in there. Um, Keep in mind that these design things, the, these design things that you put in here, aren't just done because you think they're clever or whatever, but if they support sort of the purpose of the site. So a very linear site where, and again, it's that time of year, so my mind keeps coming like to the FAFSA site, where you have 75 pages that you have to go through. It's nice to see how far you are down the line, and, and you could, you, they could have implemented that with the strike through. All right. Um, anyhow, using the little, um, the, the main point that I wanted to have is using a little eyedropper allows us to spot the color. Um, let's do that for the, let's maybe give a background of the nav section too, the same way. Select the eyedropper. Click on that, and this is 182, no, 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 142, 128, and 154. Um, go, and let's use a calculator just to show you how to do that, just because why not? All right, there is programmer mode, and I can type in 142 and convert to hex. 
That's 8E. Um, go back to decimal. Eight oh, and then one fifty four. I missed the one. Nine A. So I could go on my nav section for this, go and set. Um, background um, 8E equals pound 8E eight e, eight a All right. Hard to see. Yeah. But we could do a lot of different things. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to say, hey, I like that color anyhow. So I am going to make that a border instead. All right, there we go. Now. Notice that that goes down below a little bit. Couple things we could do for this. Let me think, let me think. Let's try doing a margin. I'm going to push it a little bit over to the left and I'm going to push it up. So. Margin right twenty PX margin top negative twenty PX. Almost. Make it forty. All right, so there we go. I normally avoid negative margins. It, it seems like, that seems like sort of the duct tape solution of the designer world, all right, by, by slapping in. But, you know, sometimes whatever works. All right. So in this case, my aim was that, and let's see how this resizes. Resizes pretty good. You don't really lose anything. We should test this across browsers, so let's go and open this up in Internet Explorer. Looks good. And across other browsers. And seems to be good. All right. So I would say we're okay with this. But notice what I did in terms of styling. All right. Now, granted, to be sure, this is a very simple web page. All right. It has the four sort of common elements: the header, the the navigation, um, the main content area, and a footer. All right. All I did in terms of positioning was did a little bit of positioning on the container to sort of center it and make it a certain size. And then I did some positioning on the nav by floating it to the right. And the rest of the things I just sort of let fall into the flow. All right. So you don't want to micromanage the, the design in, this, in the CSS. You know, usually I see this, and, 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 and usually, you know, it's the good students that do this. 
that they take this and they run with it and they go crazy to have things positioned very precisely. And that's a good thing to a degree, but beyond a certain degree, sometimes it's easier, there's easier ways if you just let the browser do what the browser do what browsers do well. All right. Now, um, I, I lost track of where we are homework-wise, so I don't know off the top of my head where we are homework-wise, but I know if not for this assignment, for the next assignment, you're asked to create sort of two versions of the same page, all right? The easiest way to do that is to create two different folders and just have your page and CSS and any images in one, page, CSS, and any images in, in the other. The HTML should be identical between the two, all right? The only difference between the two pages should be the CSS. And please make the changes between the pages significant and not simply like this is a page with a blue background, this is a page with a slightly lighter blue background, all right? Because I get that, and I mean, yeah, that kind of, you know, uh, you know, I guess maybe sometimes I need to be more specific in assigning things, but that's what I'm doing now, is being more specific. So it should ideally have a different layout. So make a fixed layout, make a floating layout. Uh, make it so the navigation's going vertically, make it so the navigation's going horizontally. Make it with the navigation on the right side, make it with the navigation or on the, on the next side. Make it with a fixed navigation. You know, do whatever you need to do, but change up the layout substantially. All right? Any questions at this point? All right. The next topic that we're going to talk about, because this dovetails nicely into the next uh, topic, which is mobile design. So, Understanding this, this is getting you most of the way to understanding mobile pages. All right, I'm going to ask a question. And, and again, it may seem like a dumb question, but I want you to consider it. Consider more than just the obvious. Don't forget the obvious, right? But consider more than the obvious. What is the difference between, what is the difference in experience between someone browsing a website on a full-size monitor versus browsing it on a phone, a mobile device? What are the differences in the experience? Okay, very good. That's actually one of those that sometimes people miss, all right? Because sometimes people get caught up thinking about the, the physical aspects of the phone and forget the fact that the user oftentimes has a little bit different information, all right? So, for example, if I was browsing LCC's website, if I was at home deciding what area to major in, all right, that's something I'd likely do on a full screen browser when I was at home sitting there. I could go look up one major, go compare it to another, maybe Google some stuff, what are job opportunities in this area, whatever. If I was simply running late for class, I wanted to call my professor to tell him I'm going to be late, then that might be something you look at from a mobile, mobile device. So, if we're going to make an observation, users have different goals. On mobile versus desktop. That's not always the case, right? And, and, and I would tend to think the more complicated website that you are talking about, the greater that this is going to be. If you think of like a website for a restaurant, you know, chances are people are going to access it with their mobile, are going to be looking for sort of the same stuff that you are. You know, what are the directions, what are the hours that are there open, what's on the menu, you know, that sort of thing. 
So a real simple site like that, there might be less of a difference. But for more, more expansive sites, there's likely to be a difference between how people are using it. What's another difference? No mouse. All right. Put another way, users interact with page and browser differently. What's another aspect of that same thing? What else do we not have or have a different, you know, probably don't have a physical keyboard. All right, we're probably using a, a virtual on-screen keyboard. So, and depending on how old you are and whether you have that special texting gene that people started to get, you know, about 18 years ago or 19 years ago, Typing on the phone can either be real easy for you or it could be real hard. All right. Um, uh huh. Okay, wow. Wow. But interacting that way and typing stuff can be, can be is, is a different experience. Let's put it that way. How do you affect how you might design a page? Right. Okay. So your form design might matter. We haven't talked about forms in this class, but, you know, I might want to use drop. All right. I might want to use things like radio buttons and check boxes. Now, you want to use those in regular forms as well, but it's especially important for, it's easier in, in the case of a mobile. How else might that affect your design? What about the no mouse? Isn't that what Roberto Duran said? Uh, during, no, I'm sorry, that was no mouse. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, how would no mouse affect the way you might design a page? Yeah, mouse over effects might be different or, or weird. Well, also, just links physically being too close together. I mean, me, me with giant hands on a screen, you know, I press like something, I press like six links usually, you know, and it's very difficult to go in. So you might make your design to have bigger, bigger links, so it's easier to have more spaces between the links, simply because users interact with it differently. What's another characteristic and another way that interacting with a web page is different in the case of a mobile user? Yes. Okay. Um, it, you can do it portrait or landscape. That's true. Um, that makes it a little less flexible. All right, because a window on a desktop, I can resize a million different ways, right? I can resize it like this, so it's full screen. I can resize it so that it's. so that it's taller than it is wide. I can resize it so it is a square. I can resize it so it's wider than it is tall. With a mobile device, you have two choices, essentially, portrait and landscape. All right? You do have two choices, though. All right? And, and there's that flexibility. What else?
a great composer. It might be Nadia Boulanger said, don't strain to avoid the obvious. What is the obvious difference between a mobile screen and a desktop screen? It's smaller. All right. All right. And again, that affects the placement of links. That affects the text that you're going to you're going to read. All right. So multi-column articles probably not so good. Multi-column layout probably not very good, simply because the physical size of the screen. All right. Whereas on a desktop, single column isn't good because the screen is too wide. So, and again, if you're, if you're thinking back to what we've talked over the past few classes, you can sort of see how some of these design elements are going to fall in place. We saw an example with a floating design, whereas on a wider screen, two columns. On a narrower screen, they're stacked two vertical columns. So, smaller screen on mobile. Can anything, anyone think of another difference? Old phones indeed have web browsers. Okay. Um, that's true. Uh, yeah, th th that's true. There, there are different... Um, different mechanisms for accessing a website um, for like some of the older phones. Okay. The ability to zoom in and zoom out. Um, you do have the ability to do that on a desktop as well, but it's probably well, you may never do it. I do it, uh, you know, just because of my vision and having a hard time reading and all that. Um, uh, and, and it's more seamless to do it. So that, that's one thing. That's a consideration. What about the bandwidth? Where do you have... Yeah, pardon me? Your data connection is different. Where are you likely to have better... Pardon me? Where, where are you going to have a better connection, typically, with a desktop or with a mobile device? Probably a desktop, right? A wired connection is going to be best of all, right? Uh, after a wired connection, a, through a wireless network can be good, which you can get via uh, a mobile device. You can connect to a wireless network. Um, but, um, you know, if, if you're connecting via 3G or 4G, that's going to be, that's going to be slower. All right, so a slower connection typically on that. Now, we look at all these things. And to add to this, users typically, in addition to having more uh, different goals, I will say that users typically are more focused in their searching on web. I may go on a website and just play around just because I'm bored on my desktop machine, you know. I'm liable, I'm, not, I'm less liable to do that on my mobile device. I'm going to be more focused. I'm browsing. It's not particularly fun to browse. It's a little clunky and therefore I'm probably going to be looking for something specific. All right. Now, all these things taken together in my mind, say one thing, all right? And that is typically the designs for mobile sites are going to be simpler than the designs for desktop sites, all right? The bandwidth isn't as good, so therefore maybe I'm not going to have a lot of images or maybe I'm going to have smaller images or whatever. Smaller screen, pardon me? RAM, RAM, right. Slower connection and a less powerful device in general. Um, all these things taken together, 
indicate that the way to go for a mobile web page is to make it simple. So, we've talked about design period and we've said that simplicity is a good thing. Well, in a way, mobile web design really sort of reinforces and forces our hand in that direction <laughs> to, uh, to a greater degree. All right. Um, next time we'll look at some specific things that we can do to optimize for the mobile experience. To a large degree, they're going to be extensions of the stuff that we've done so far. For example, especially the more recent ones. So we're not probably going to be doing fixed layouts with this, right? We're going to be doing the, the, the fluid layouts and all that. And we'll be doing some other things that will sort of further optimize that. So that's what we'll pick up on Thursday. Any questions or comments? We all set? Questions in North Ridgeville? Are we all set? All right. We'll see you in lab.